Hello, and welcome to a brand new day of free-to-play here on Magic the Gathering Real Life. Get the dish on the latest with me, Lord Rumfish. This is the green section of Defense of Veldmar, the second custom set I've created in Veldmar block. Uh, if you've missed the earlier parts, check out the links in the description below. Anyway, let's go ahead and dive in here. So this is Abnormal Terrain. Green and a colorless common sorcery. Banish cards until you reveal a land card. Then flip a coin. If you win the flip, put that land onto the battlefield tapped. If you lose the flip, put the land into your hand and you gain two life. So either way, you're going to find your next land. Uh, if it doesn't come into the battlefield, you get to gain a little bit of life. So the fail state of the coin flip it's actually not that bad. There could occasionally be moments where you would prefer to fail just to gain a little bump of life. Uh, in terms of how this would do for limited play, uh, good. Yeah, you, you need stuff like this in the early game. It can either straight up ramp you or just push you, you know, further ahead, find your next land drop, churn through the deck a bit, whether you're gaining life or uh, ramping outright, either way, this is going to be a playable card. So I'll call it a three. Ancestral Might. Uh, we have a rare one green instant. Draw a card, then up to one target creature gets plus X plus X and trample until end of turn, where X is the number of cards you've drawn this turn. So if you're playing this on your own turn, then this will be the second card you've drawn, and you'll be giving something at least plus two, plus two, and trample. And uh, that's a pretty good trick, right? For one green mana, you draw a card and give something plus two, plus two, and trample. Uh, that's a pretty phenomenal rate. Uh, good enough to see constructed play, I'd imagine. Uh, the pump can be bigger, though, if you engineer a situation where you've drawn more cards for the turn. But the floor of the card is good. So um, there's only so high you can rate a combat trick in limited, but this is a really good one. Um, I think this is, I'm gonna give it a 3.5. I, I think it's an absurdly good trick. Uh, replaces itself with a card draw. It's great for Quelni College because they're the ones who uh, have all the payoffs for drawing cards, but it's good enough to pull you in um, anyway. So, yeah, 3.5. Ancient Juggernaut. So, these uh, giant old uh, constructs that are made out of stone and crystal are... Harkening back to the war between the Tolgath and the Ancients, uh, two Planeswalker factions that have a lot to do with the uh, history of Olgrotha, homelands. And it turns out that Veldmar is a plane that the Ancients, one of those two factions, inhabited, where they built their war machines. And the war abruptly ended um, when the... Uh, Apocalypse Chime Ring, which killed the Ancients who were here on Veldmar, but it left their devices intact. So these are still around and often in working order. Like this Ancient Juggernaut. So this is a green and four colorless, 5-3 uh, artifact creature Juggernaut, common. It has Bulwark 3 and Trample. So Bulwark 3 means whenever this creature attacks, it gets plus 0, plus 3 until end of turn. Blocks as a 5-3, attacks as a 5-6, has Trample. And it attacks each combat if able, just like Juggernaut. So this is uh, probably a good card for Roka. Roka wants to have artifact creatures, and Roka is pretty good at pressing the attack. They've got a lot of good things to do from 
like three drops all the way up to like six drops or so. Um, Roka can really beat down in that range. And so this might be kind of a Roka card. Um, anyone in green can get this and it's a pretty decent five drop for uh, laying down the beats. And if you need to, it can block the turn you play it because it doesn't have haste. Or if it had haste, you could play it post-combat. Anyway. It's um, it's not amazing, but it's a very competent attacker. Um, I think um, the general rating I'm going to give this card is a 2. Um, it's a very competent attacker, and... This format is a little slower, so things that are like five, six, seven drops are more valuable than normal. So even with the drawback here, I'm, I'm going to give it a two. Bygone Juggernaut. This is a rare. Uh, green and seven colorless. Artifact creature Juggernaut. It is a 10-6. It has Rampage 4 and Trample. And Rampage 4 means that uh, whenever it becomes blocked, it gets plus that number, plus that number, until end of turn for each creature blocking it beyond the first. So if one thing blocks it, Rampage doesn't trigger. But as soon as two or more things block it, Rampage starts triggering. Um, it attacks each combat if able, cannot be blocked by walls, and it's got this old ability of Regenerate. Pay one green, Regenerate. And the reminder text here says the next time this creature would be destroyed this turn, it isn't. Instead, tap it, remove all damage from it, and remove it from combat. That's what a uh, regeneration shield does. So you uh, pay the green to put the regeneration shield on it ahead of the effect that would have destroyed it. And then all of that takes place. So this is kind of like two Juggernauts uh, added together into one card. You know, the original cost four, this costs eight. The original is a five, three, this is a 10, six. Uh, it's got some extra abilities the original didn't have. It's a good, strong attacker. And as long as you leave yourself a green mana open to defend it with, it's uh, surprisingly hard to kill it with a regular removal spell. It'll still die to exile or uh, to a sacrifice effect. But modern day cards don't really have a plan to deal with regeneration. So this is going to be a surprisingly hard card to get off the field. Um, for that reason, it's probably better than it looks. And even though you have to attack with it each combat if able, uh, it's a 10 power trampler, so most of the time it would be a good idea <laughs> to turn it sideways. Um, this is a great top end, uh, especially in limited. Uh, in constructed, there are some ways to fetch artifact creatures straight out of your library to the battlefield. Um, so aside from ramping up to this mana, there might be other ways to trick it into play in Constructed. But for Limited, I'm going to call this a 3.5. You know, it's uh, it's not foolproof, and it doesn't uh, like draw you cards and net you advantages in that kind of way. But as long as you can regenerate it, it's uh, it's pretty sticky, pretty hard to get off the board. Chaos Spawner. This is a green and four colorless. A creature horror. It's a 6-5 rare. It has reach, vigilance, and ward. Then the ward cost is this creature's controller flips a coin. And it says whenever you flip a coin or resolve a spell or ability that uses the word random or randomly in its rules text, create a 3-1 black horror creature token. This ability triggers only once each turn. So if someone targets it and you haven't uh, triggered this ability for the turn yet, then it's going to create a 3-1 black horror, which will leave you behind a body even after someone's uh, targeted this and killed it. So it's interesting. Um, 
if you get it to stick around for any length of time, uh, there's a lot of different ways that you could trigger this ability, including on the opponent's turn. And at that point, if you can engineer where you're making, you know, a three power creature on your turn, a three power creature on the opponent's turn, you're going to win the game pretty quickly, flooding the board with tokens like that. Uh, it is also a 6-5 reach vigilance for 5. Um, pretty impressive stat line, generally speaking, that replaces itself with another creature. So... I don't know if it's quite there and constructed, but maybe. Um, if there's a deck for the uh, coin flip and random uh, triggers, this might be part of it. In limited, yeah, it's good. Um, it's so good, in fact, I will give it a four. Destructive Battle. Uh, this is a green and a colorless uh, common sorcery. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature, battle, or planeswalker. All of those are in this set. There's only one planeswalker, but there are a bunch of battles. Um, there's at least one uh, for every faction, and there are nine factions. And I think there's actually a couple extra battles on top of that. So uh, this is a pretty good uh, spread of targets. And then you also banish one and create a trash token. Banish one's exiling the top card of your library. And a trash token is an artifact token named Trash that has pay one, tap, sacrifices artifact, mill one, then surveil one. So this is a very functional bite spell. On top of that, it can flip battles for you. And also it turns on um, synergies that some of the factions care about. Zarnik cares about uh, self-banishing and trash tokens, and this checks both of those boxes. So this is secretly kind of a Zarnik card, white, blue, green. Uh, Roka Guild cares about having artifacts. So white, red, green is also going to like this. And then uh, it's just a pretty playable card in general on top of all that. So, yeah, I think in limited, most people are going to value this right around a three probably as removal. Um, if you're like Zarnik or Roka, maybe it bumps up to a 3.5. Dichotomy Mage. Uh, green and a colorless. Uh, this is a 1-1 one, one human wizard. She is a common. When Dichotomy Mage enters the battlefield... Banish two, then create a trash token and a quintessence token. So a quintessence token is a colorless enchantment token named quintessence. And it has sacrifice this enchantment, add colorless. It also has pay two generic, sacrifice this enchantment, draw a card. Kind of like uh, a treasure token and a clue token, except it doesn't make mana of any color. So... This um, checks a bunch of boxes. And it's just kind of a glue piece that smooths out um, everything that you're trying to do. And some factions will get especially good use out of it. Uh, Zarnik, obviously, with the self-banish and the trash. Um, but on top of that, the quintessence is useful for the colorless Thune faction. So if you pair green with that, uh, this will go well there. The Quintessence also ramps you on mana. Um, all of the factions would in, enjoy that. Um, in particular, like the Far Realm and the Ulthrak have some big expensive things they're trying to do. They like extra mana. And uh, generally speaking... This is just a bundle, bundle of value on a, a cheap little creature, which means it's not bad to use it for uh, the Nolvir. White, black, green. They are aristocrats. And this is, you know, giving you all its value <laughs> from its enters the battlefield trigger. You don't mind sacrificing the dichotomy mage to power up their other stuff. So 
does a lot of good stuff um, in a variety of decks. I'd say um, since you can always, you know, sack the Quintessence token to draw a card, this is probably a three. This is just a really helpful two drop that smooths everything over for you. Energized Golem. This is a green and three colorless. Artifact creature Golem. It's a 4-4 four, four, uncommon. It has trample. And when this enters the battlefield, you banish one, then create a Power Stone token. Uh, Power Stones came from the Brothers War. It is a colorless artifact token uh, named Power Stone with tap, add colorless. The mana can't be spent to cast a non-artifact spell. And whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. So uh, this is going to gain you a life when it creates the Power Stone. So this is giving you a 4-4 Trampler for 4, getting you ahead on mana. Um, it's, you have to be a little bit tricky about how you use that mana. Um, you know, you can pay activated abilities, triggered abilities, all of that, but as far as spell casting, it has to be an artifact spell. And it's gaining you life. Um, so this is a Roka Guild card. Um, you know, it's very much geared towards an Artifact Matters theme. Probably wouldn't be bad in Zarnik. Zarnik has a, a fair few artifacts uh, with their trash theme. It would gain you a bunch of life as you make trash tokens. And for everyone else, it's a decent sized creature. You might find a use for a Power Stone token. So for Roka, um, this card's great. Um, you know, probably a 3.5 pretty handily. Uh, for Zarnik, let's call it a 3. Um, it's still a, a really nice uh, overall package for Zarnik. Uh, for everyone else, I'll call it a 2.5. It's you know, it's maybe not quite as sure of a thing to include in your deck if it doesn't synergize. So even though it's a really solid 4-drop, there might be occasions where it doesn't make the cut if it doesn't have any synergy with your deck. But a lot of the time it would make the cut. Enormous Worm. This is a green and 6 colorless. Uh, we have a creature Worm, 8-6 common. That's it. This is part of the vanilla creature cycle. There's one for each color and one at colorless. So this green member of the cycle is big. <laughs> it's just a giant hunk of worm. Uh, the factions that play well with this, um, Ulthrak, um, the black, red, green faction, they have a whole thing about creatures with mana cost six or greater matter. They trigger their other cards, they can fetch them out of the library more easily. Um, there's just a lot of ways that they synergize with big creatures in that way. So if you are in Ulthrak in particular, um, this card looks a little better than it otherwise would. Uh, also this format's a little slower, so big things like this uh, tend to be more valuable than they normally are. You know, if this was a fast format, this would be a pretty unplayable card, but in this slower format, you know, you're going to find better options most of the time. But I think this is going to be a playable kind of a card. Uh, I think if you're Ulthrak, this is probably worthy of a 2. You know, it synergizes enough with what your deck is doing at that point that I think uh, you want to run it more so than most people. And for everyone else, there's a lot of big stuff to do in the set. Um, you probably don't have to fall back to the worm very often, but if you need to, I would say it doesn't rate any worse than a 1.5. You know, it's filler, but it's playable filler. Bar Realm Blast. This is two green and two colorless. It has an uncommon sorcery. Flip a coin. If you win the flip, choose any number of modes. If you lose the flip, choose one mode. 
Destroy up to one target artifact. Destroy up to one target enchantment. Destroy up to one target land. Destroy up to one target planeswalker. So, this is uh, kind of like a creeping mold if you lose the flip. Um, if you're not used to seeing green destroy uh, planeswalkers, green did that right at first. Um, back in Lorwyn block, they had uh, planeswalker removal in green's part of the color pie at that time. They later decided to get rid of that. I think that might have been a mistake. Um, I feel like they've probably taken enough from green at this point and sent it off to other colors like white that um, maybe green should have kept planeswalker removal. I feel like uh, I'm content to give it back. Now, if you win the flip, uh, then this is uh, a potential wrecking ball of a play. Granted, they need to have these things like artifacts, enchantments, and planeswalkers, but they're going to have land. They're going to have land, so it's always going to be land destruction. Um, whether or not you're uh, happy to run it as land destruction, that's up to you. But I think this spell is good enough that it could see constructed play. And spikes are not going to like that. <laughs> Tournament players hate flipping coins. Um, they hate randomness. Uh, but this card also turns on things for the Far Realm faction with its coin flip. So, uh, it's a very flexible and useful card, and sometimes it'll be an absurd blowout. So, uh, in limited, I would say... This is probably main deckable... Um, most of the time. There's quite a few artifacts running around in this format. So I'd say you're going to get the artifact and land modes pretty often. I, I think that would be good enough to call it a two and a half. You know, it looks like a sideboard card for a limited, but I think it's actually plenty playable in the main deck. Far Realm Watcher. This is two green and four colorless. We have an uncommon creature horror. It's a 7-2 with vigilance. When this enters the battlefield, breach. That means you shuffle your library, banish one, exile the top card. If it's a land, put it onto the battlefield. If it's a spell, cast the spell without paying its mana cost. That's not a May ability. If you hit a spell, you must cast it if you're able. So this is meant to go with the Breach deck. Um, this creature on its own uh, is very hit or miss. You know, sometimes it's just going to ramp you a land uh, when you hit on the Breach. Other times you're going to hit another 6 or 7 drop that has Breach and it's going to Breach off again. So the, uh, the range of outcomes on Breaching is... Uh, Pretty extreme, pretty high uh, ceiling, pretty low floor. Uh, you're always getting a card, though, even if it's just a land coming into play. So, uh, constructed-wise, you probably want to make sure you get to um, as many cards as you can uh, from the spells in your deck to, say, breach on them, so that you have the greatest chance of chaining them together. In Limited, you could still try to do some of the same. Um, it's a little bit more hit or miss. Um, it's still a good blocker. And with some combat tricks to back it up, it could be pretty scary. Um, if you give a giant thing like this Trample, for example. Um, overall, I would say if you're not trying to do the Breach deck... Um, then this is kind of more filler level. You know, it's a big thing. It gives you card advantage, you know, replaces itself. Maybe gives you mana advantage by casting a free spell. But uh, the two toughness is a drawback. So if you're not in the Breach deck, I'm going to call it a uh, two. If you are in the Breach deck, I'm going to call it 
more like a three. It's going to be one of the things you want to hit and try to breach again. Also, it's a little bit better in Ulthrak where they care about, you know, six plus creatures. So Ulthrak will split the difference and call it a 2.5. Foraging Worm. It's so cute. It's eating cactus fruit. Anyway. <laughs> it's a green and five colorless. Uh, it's a 6-5 creature worm. It's an uncommon. It has Bulwark 4 and Trample. So when it attacks, it's going to be a 6-9. Nice. <laughs> when it blocks, it's a 6-5. Whenever you cast a creature spell with mana cost 6 or more, you gain 5 life. So this is an Ulthrak card. Um, this is, you know, playing into their theme of creatures with a mana cost of 6 or greater matters. So you get this down and it's a pretty solid chunk of creature, but if you have more of them to follow up with, they're going to start gaining you 5 life. Um, and that uh, is a pretty good way to try to outrace the opponent, put the game out of reach for them trying to finish you off, and leaves you in a position to close out the game with your giant creatures. So, uh, for the Ulthrak, this is great. This is uh, a wonderful payoff uh, for what they're trying to do, as well as kind of an enabler. So it's probably a 3.5 if you're Ulthrak. Um, everyone else, it's fine. I don't know how many 6 and 7 drops you'll have if you're not Ulthrak. So I don't know how much you'll trigger it. But it's a fine creature on its own, and it's probably, you know, worthy of like a 2.5. Boxfire. This is a reprint. Um, from Ice Age? From a long time ago. It's a green and two colorless, uh, as an instant, uncommon, untapped target attacking creature. Prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to and dealt by that creature this turn. Draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So, uh, this is kind of a fog effect sort of a thing here, where uh, green used to get these effects like prevent all combat damage would be dealt this turn. So Foxfire is just doing that for a single creature, but you can also use it on your own attacking creature if it gets in trouble. So if you swing in, the opponent has a combat trick, uh, does something unexpected, you can just untap your attacker, get it out of trouble, and now it's ready to block. So it's uh, totally serviceable if you've got a, a situation that looks like it's a little bit risky as an attack. Foxfire is like added insurance. You can back out of that. And then if you don't need it for that, well, you've always got it on the opponent's turn to uh, blank one of their creatures attacking. Unfortunately, it untaps it for them to block with. But uh, this also replaces itself with a card draw. You draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So, Foxfire is kind of a forgettable card, but it's also not useless. Um, like most of these reprints that I've included, um, I'm going to rate Foxfire around a 1.5, but the utility on Foxfire is greater than some of the others, like uh, Dazzling Beauty. I think Foxfire has more applications for you as the attacker, as well as stopping the opponent's creature. Uh, for that reason, I think Foxfire might sneakily be a two. It might be uh, better than it looks. Gift of Lore. Uh, green and three colorless. Uh, we have a rare sorcery. This is not Jason Vraska. I didn't realize until after um, the AI had spat out this art. I was like, oh, hey, this, this reminds me a little bit of Jason Vraska. These are not those characters, but I think it's kind of interesting that it's like an echo of them. Anyway, target opponent may 
banish seven. Then put one of the exiled cards into their hand. If they do, you draw three cards. Otherwise, you surveil three, then draw two cards. So yes, this is a green card draw spell. Um, you know, we haven't seen a lot of this in green other than like Harmonize, um, which came from a Time Spiral block. I think it's fine uh, to give green effects like this as long as they're you know, pretty clearly not quite as efficient as a blue card would be at doing the same thing. So, you know, this isn't an instant, it's a sorcery. And uh, if this was a blue card draw spell at these numbers, at this rate, um, everyone would yawn. You know, if, at a, as a blue card, this would be very unexciting. In green, though, it's a little bit more interesting. And sneakily, this is uh, kind of a uh, Pax Dread card. Pax Dread are blue, black, green. They're the ones who uh, are trying to mill out the opponent's library by exiling it. And green is sneakily offering the opponent, uh, you know, hey, tutor, uh, find the best card in your top seven. All you have to do is just banish the other six. <laughs> if they do that, though, they're playing into the strategy of Paxtrud or the Colorless Thun faction. Uh, it has a fair bit of, you know, banish milling of the opponent as well. So green normally doesn't mill the opponent, but uh, it does a little bit more of it in this set than it normally ever would. Uh, it's just me trying to find a way in green's color pie of uh, tempting the opponent somehow into the mill theme. So... I like the way it turned out. I don't think it's uh, overpowerful or anything. It's just kind of interesting. In limited, I would say this is a totally fair piece of card draw. You know, the floor of the card, surveil three, draw two. That's good selection. You know, if you're looking for something in particular, you could bin three cards, draw two, and that's a pretty deep look into the library. Um, if the opponent takes your deal and you draw three, that's also a pretty great rate uh, for a card draw spell. So I think this is um, a card you usually are going to play, especially in a slower format like this one. All that in consideration, I think it's about a three. I think it basically always makes the cut in your deck. And if you're trying to mill out the opponent, then uh, tick it up by half a point. You know, if you're Paxdred or you're pairing this with uh, the Colorless Thun faction, we'll call it a 3.5 in that case. Gorgon Widowmaker. This is a green and three colorless. 4-3 uh, Gorgon Warrior at Uncommon. She has Death Touch and Trample. Whenever Gorgon Widowmaker deals combat damage to a battle, create a 0-1 colorless wall artifact creature token with Defender. So this is one of the few cards that um, references uh, battles specifically. Um, I didn't do so much of that. You know, in March of the Machine, they were all about the battles. Um, here, the battles are more like, you know, just another aspect of the set. So there aren't a lot of things that specifically mechanically uh, call out the battles, but this is one of them. The idea is that um, she's turning random soldiers and, you know, I guess uh, horror and nightmare creatures from the Far Realm into uh, these stone sculptures of a sort, <laughs> making these uh, artifact walls. So Death Touch and Trample is uh, quite a pairing. When you're trampling, you only have to assign lethal damage to each blocking creature. So even if you block uh, the Gorgon with uh, something that would kill her, she still only has to assign one point of damage to it, however big it is. And she can assign the rest as trample damage uh, to go beyond, such as to a battle. 
So death touch tramplers are hard to stop. It's hard to stop the damage coming through from a death touch trample creature. Um, this makes them pretty good, uh, especially in limited. So for limited play, I would say um, she's going to be good. Um, you know, for just about any green deck, I give her like a 3.5. I think she'd be pretty excellent. Every color combination has uh, battles to try to flip over. Uh, sneakily, she's a little bit better if you're Roka because they have the Artifact Matters theme and she's generating artifact tokens for you. Uh, also, she could be generating extra creatures for you to sacrifice if you're Nolvir, white, black, green. So uh, her stock raises even a little bit higher for those combinations, but she's just a great card all the way around. Grave Grove Tree Folk. Uh, green and a colorless. We have a 0-2 Tree Folk Shaman that's a rare. Has Trample and Vigilance. It gets plus one plus one for each forest you control. So uh, in Constructed, you know, on turn two, if you got two forests, you play this, and it's already a 2-4 Trample Vigilance. Yeah, it's just going to keep getting bigger from there. Uh, it has another ability, Pay 1, Sacrifice Another Creature, Banish Cards Until You Reveal a Forest Card, and Put That Card Into Your Hand. So this does exile chunks of your library as you're going. So um, in Constructed, you can make a deck that's got you know, all forests in your mana base, and you're not going to exile that many cards when you activate it. But uh, it's a little bit more risky when you're using it in limited and you've got a three-color deck. You know, it's nice to have this sacrifice outlet if you're um, with a Nolvir, a white, black, green. But how many forests are you going to have in your mana base? Now, the common tap duels have basically end types. So it's another way that you can get a hit, but still. There might be a practical limit to how many times you can sacrifice and find a forest, because you're exiling cards until you hit the next one. Uh, overall, it's an interesting card. I think it's stronger in Constructed than it is in Limited, that being said. Um, you know, if you have even one forest in play, it's going to be at least a 1-3 Trample Vigilance, which is okay. And you have the potential to get more land drops. So, I think if you are Nolvir, um, you like having the Sacrifice Outlet. And for them, this card is probably a 3. Uh, for everyone else, I think it drops off quite a bit, and it's more like a 2. Hardy Cactus. Uh, this is one green. We have a 1-1 one, one creature plant. It's an uncommon. has defender. When it dies, create a food token. And then you can pay a green, exile hardy cactus from your graveyard, create a food token. This is a Nolvir card. White, black, green. This is made to sacrifice. You get value for doing so. You get value out of your graveyard. Uh, so this is like a little setup piece, something that's made to uh, function as synergy for the sacrifice deck. But you could also make pretty good use of it in Roka, as long as you can get this thing to die. Um, then it can potentially make two artifacts for you, and they care about having artifacts in play. So... Uh, those two would probably like to have this card. Everyone else is probably more towards a zero. So if you have the synergies for the card, uh, it's probably like a 2.5, maybe even a three. You really need cheap early stuff uh, that you want to sacrifice. Harness the Scrap Heap. So this is a, kind of a weird one. It's a Zarnik card, white, blue, green. So it's a green and three colorless, rare sorcery. Choose two of the following modes. You can create two trash tokens. You can gain life equal to the number of artifacts you control. 
You can deal X damage to target Battle or Planeswalker, where X is the number of artifacts you control. Or you can return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand if its mana cost is equal to or less than the number of artifacts you control. Instead, put it onto the battlefield. Um, actually, I guess this is a Aroka card. It's a Aroka card, but it's also a Zarnik card. They have quite a bit of overlap. Um, the fact it makes trash tokens makes it good for Zarnik. And then all of the things caring about artifacts, not just trash tokens, means it also plays very well with Roka. So, if you are in those uh, combinations, white, blue, green, or white, red, green, uh, this is going to do some good stuff for you. You know, it can help you uh, win battles, get up on your artifact count, gain some life, regrow artifacts. You get to pick two of those modes. So, I would say for those uh, combinations, this card's probably a 3.5. Um, pretty great thing to uh, add to your deck. And if you're not in those, then uh, it might not do much of anything. <laughs> and uh, probably scrapes down towards a 0 0.5 where it's more of a sideboard card. Healer of the Old Ways. This is a green and five colorless, a 4-3 creature giant shaman at common. She's got Bulwark 2, so she blocks as a 4-3, she attacks as a 4-5. And when Healer of the Old Ways enters the battlefield, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. So, she's a giant eternal witness. Um, I think everyone's going to be happy to uh, play this card because a big creature that's also netting you value is probably going to be more relevant in this format than uh, trying to get a good tempo play. I think playing for the long game and playing for value is probably going to be the way to go in this limited format. Um, has some extra oomph if you're in uh, Ulthrak because of the 6 mana cost. But overall I think this card's going to uh, perform very well in the format and I'm going to give her a rating of uh, 3. Yeah, 3. Hydroponics Golem. This is a green and 2 colorless uh, for a 3-3 three, three artifact creature golem. It's a common. When it enters the battlefield, banish one, then create a food token. And you can tap to add one mana of any color. So this is a Roka card because it makes two artifacts, but it's also a 3-3 three, three that taps for mana of any color. And in that regard, I think um, pretty much everyone who's playing green wants this. This is a three and four color set. You need mana fixing, you need ramping. So this card's just great. Uh, this card does so much for you. Uh, it does even more for you if you're Roka, but I would say this card's like a 3.5, uh, just generally speaking. Maybe Roka even rates it a 4. Into the Breach. Green and three colorless. We have a common sorcery. Breach. That's it. <laughs> you, you breach when you play this. So you shuffle your library, exile the top card. If it's a land, put it onto the battlefield. If it's a spell, cast it without paying its mana cost. So if you're in the breach deck where you have a lot of things that have breach, there's a chance you can chain them together um, by revealing another thing and that card breaches. And then you got another shot. Now getting another breach. It's a really swingy uh, f way to build the deck, especially for limited. Um, the fail case on this card is it ramps you a mana. And if you're trying to do a breach deck, a lot of the things you're trying to get are giant creatures that cost, you know, six and seven mana uh, that say breach. So on the fail case of this card where it just ramps you up a land, 
that's uh, still probably playing into what your deck is doing if you've put it into the correct deck. So uh, breach decks are probably ramp decks. Uh, they're full of giant creatures. They need a lot of mana. So if all this does is make mana for you, it's not necessarily the worst. Um, you know, it's a little inefficient at four mana. But there's the upshot on the card where you could hit one of those six or seven drops and get more value off of it. So uh, going into the, the right kind of deck that wants to keep ramping its mana and hit giant things, that could be like the Ulthrak deck as well. They wouldn't mind this card. Uh, for those decks, I would say this is worth it. And it's probably about a three. And uh, for everyone else, you know, if you don't have that high of a curve, if ramping isn't as important to you, the card's probably more like a two. Invasive Converter. This is a uh, green and a colorless. We have a creature, Plant Horror. It is a 3-1, uncommon. And has the activated ability, pay one generic. Add blue, black, red, or green. Until the beginning of your next turn, target land and opponent controls gains tap. Add blue, black, red, or green. Activate only once per turn. So this is a uh, aggressively statted two drop that can reliably filter mana for you. And the only downside is you might give your opponent some extra mana filtering. Um, so if they were struggling to piece together the right colors of mana, then you might uh, shoot yourself in the foot there. But if they're firing on all cylinders, then you just get to uh, you know, filter your mana through this guy and it's no big deal. This is part of a cycle of four cards, um, creatures from the Far Realm, who are uh, three ones or a one three for the blue one, who all uh, filter mana somehow. They all do it differently. This is one of the more reliable ones, one of the ones that's easier to use. Um, I think this card's uh, pretty decent, and I think it's a little better than some of the other members of this cycle. If you need the mana filtering, uh, this card could be like a 2.5. And if you're not needing the mana so much, then it's just kind of a, you know, filler two drop that might occasionally filter mana for you. And then it's more like a, you know, a 1.5 or a 2. Lure Hexer. This is a green and two colorless. Uh, 4 2 Horror. It's common. Whenever it attacks, target a random untapped creature defending player controls. That creature must block Lure Hexer this turn if able. So you can't control what the thing is that's going to be forced to block Lure Hexer unless the opponent doesn't have very many things that are untapped. If they just have one creature that's untapped, then this is definitely going to target that one thing. So there are ways to play around with this ability where you can increase the odds or be more certain of the outcome. But otherwise, uh, this is another way you can trigger things from the Far Realm that care about something happening at random in the rules text. And it's a 4-2 for 3, which is moderately playable. So if you're in the Far Realm deck and you're, you know, triggering coin flips and random stuff, then this card's probably like a 2.5 or something. And if you're not in that deck, then, uh, you yeah, know, maybe this card's just a 2. Occasionally, you can attack when the moment's right and get some use out of it. Or keep the opponent on the back foot where they're always having to play around that. Memory Avenger. This is a green and five colorless. Creature Giant Warrior. It was a rare, 7-7. Seven, seven. It has Reach, Trample, and Ward, 2. 
Whenever one or more cards are exiled from your library, untap target permanent and you gain two life. This ability triggers only once each turn. As long as you own 10 or more cards in exile, Memory Avenger gets plus five, plus five. So this is a big creature that is expensive to target because of the ward. So it's a pretty good beating and uh, if you're not doing the uh, Zarnik thing where you're banishing your own library, you might not be able to depend on uh, hitting the 10 card threshold into exile. But if you are doing that, or if an opponent you're playing against is, you know, being the Paxdred or Thune, and they're exiling a bunch of your library, uh, they could unintentionally set up this guy being a 12-12. That would be a... Uh, you know, bad for them. It's also quite good if you're Zarnik because you uh, get to untap uh, permanent and gain two life once each turn. And that can target like a land. If you need to generate a little bit more mana, it could effectively give this guy vigilance uh, by untapping him. You know, it's uh, it has some useful synergies with the set. And it's also just a big honking creature with some keywords. So uh, in limited, this guy's going to be a beating. Um, I'd say a four. Yeah, we'll we'll call him a four in limited. Uh, in constructed, I'm I'm not sure, but it should be easier to engineer the situation where you've exiled ten cards, and that would definitely give it uh, more of a push for constructed. Oasis Worm. This is a green and four colorless. We have a creature Worm. It's a 4-4 common. It has reach. When Oasis Worm enters the battlefield, you gain two life. Draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. Uh, this is just value. You know, this is uh, a decently sized uh, defensive green creature that replaces itself with a card and gains you a little bit of life it's uh it's very handy all the way around and drawing a card makes it useful for um Quelnai college uh it's blue red green where they care about hitting extra card draw triggers even if they're on the opponent's turn most of those things can trigger pretty reasonably on the opponent's turn as well so yeah, just a solid creature all the way around. Um, I'd say this card's like a 2.5 easily. Um, maybe Quelnai College would call it a 3. Psionic Giant. Uh, this is a green and 4 colorless. You have a creature, Giant Wizard. It has an uncommon 4-5. It has Reach and Ward, Banish 2. So uh, the person trying to target this... Uh, they have to exile the top two cards of their library. And whenever one or more cards are exiled or milled from an opponent's library, you gain one life. So if they do target him, his ward is going to gain you a life as well. And if they don't get rid of him, he plays well uh, with the Paxdred faction. As you're milling them out, you're gaining a little bit of life in the process. Or if you're with the Colorless Thune faction, that could trigger him as well. So, uh, the Paxdred cards tend to be more defensive. They're trying to sort of wall themselves up as they uh, mill the opponent out. So this giant is for that strategy. He is for the strategy of milling out the opponent. And the ward helps to trigger that to push them along the way. It's a sneaky way that a green card is able to participate in uh, milling out the opponent. Renewal. This is a reprint. I have had this printed in uh, Wastes of Veldmar as well. So this is a reprint from Homelands. Not only did it appear in the previous set, it's appearing in this set too. Uh, it just it plays very well uh, for what we need to be doing here. So it's a green and two colorless. It is a common sorcery, has an additional cost to cast the spell, sacrifice a land. 
Search your library for a basic land card, put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle. Draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So you get to ditch a land that you don't need, fetch a land to fix your colors, and then you replace this card with another card. And the land that comes in is untapped. So if you have a use uh, for that extra one mana, uh, this sneakily might not even cost you three. It might just cost two if you have a use for the mana. This is a great uh, little glue card that's going to fix your mana and kind of, you know, give you card velocity to churn through the deck. So that's just a great helper piece um, for a three and four color format. I, I think the first copy or two of this in your deck are uh, kind of a no-brainer. It's a pretty easy thing to include, so I'd call it like a three. Risky Taming. This is one green, uncommon sorcery. Target player banishes four. Then they may put a creature card from among the exiled cards into their hand. So you can use this yourself to uh, find a creature out of your top four cards, hopefully. Or you can aim this at the opponent, and you can be trying to mill them out, but with the risk that they find a really good creature at the same time. So this is uh, another one of the sneaky cards that's letting green participate with uh, Paxdred and Thun in terms of milling out the opponent. Temptation Ranger. Uh, green and a colorless. This is a 1-2 Gorgon Ranger. She's common. She has Death Touch. And when she enters the battlefield, target player banishes four. Then they may put a land card from among the exiled cards into their hand. So again... Uh, this is something you can use yourself to probably hit your next land drop. Or you can level it at the opponent to push them towards milling out, but you'll probably give them a land in the process. So again, this is another sneaky green card that uh, can help mill the opponent. Thune's Remaking. Green and four colorless, uncommon sorcery. Search your library for a land. Put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. Banish one, then create a quintessence token. So first I'd like to point out that this does not fetch a basic land. This fetches any land. So it's got that going for it. You're tutoring something out. On top of that, you're also making a quintessence token, which can be sacrificed for mana. So this can be kind of like a uh, two-mana ramp spell. The Quintessence is only a one-time thing, but uh, this can take you straight from four to six, even if you miss a land drop. So whether or not you need the spell depends on how big your deck goes. If you're playing a lot of giant creatures, like Ultharak, or uh, if you're in Far Realm faction, uh, blue, black, red, green, everything but white, they have some big stuff uh, they're trying to make their way up to with Breach. In those kind of colors, I'd say that this is a good spell for them. It's probably worthy of at least a two and a half. And in the colorless Thune faction, you're making a Quintessence token. Um, for everyone else, if they don't need the mana ramp quite as much, then... Uh, tapers off in usefulness and falls down to maybe like a two. Tome of Growth. This is a green and a colorless um, artifact equipment, uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus three plus one trample and has whenever this creature attacks, draw a card. It equips for five. I realize that equip for five is a lot, but uh, whenever this creature attacks, draw a card is also a lot. <laughs> it doesn't have to connect. It doesn't need to deal combat damage to something. All you have to do is be able to turn it sideways. And you draw the card. So in that regard, um, I felt like this was something to compare more to cards like JM Day Tome. Um, so you're getting a giant buff on your creature, you know, plus three power, gaining trample, 
and whenever it attacks, you draw a card. If the creature survives, then uh, it's going to be multiplying the value for you at a crazy rate. Uh, even if you have to re-equip it, though, sometimes it's worth it to do so for the potential to draw a card. So it's pricey, but I think it's fair. Um, you know, I don't think it's busted or anything, but I, I think it's better than it looks, even though it's expensive to equip. So, and there is some need uh, for ways to uh, bust through a stalemate in the format, and this does that pretty handily. Overall, I would call this card like a two, I think. I think you're uh, reasonably happy to include one copy of this with your deck, and it gives you this kind of uh, inevitability. It turns all of your creatures into giant threats, and all of your creatures turn into card drawing engines. It's slow, but I think having access to that in your deck is uh, pretty nice. I mean, I personally would probably rate it higher than a 2 because of the way I like to play limited. Um, but I think it's fair to give it a 2 in this case. Trash Raider. This is a green and 2 colorless. 1-1 uh, one, one Goblin Rogue. Uncommon. When Trash Raider enters the battlefield, create a food token and a trash token. Draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So uh, this little guy uh, got printed instead of me reprinting Pie Knight. I, I seriously considered reprinting Pie Knight for my sage. He has the same stats as this guy with the draw a card on the upkeep, but without the food token and the trash token. Ultimately, I decided this slot needed to have more synergies, um, and it does. Man, this plays well with uh, just about everything. Plays well with Zarnik for the trash. Plays well with the Nolvir because it's uh, done all its value for you. Now you don't mind sacrificing it. Plays well with Roka because it makes two artifacts. Plays well with the Quelni because it draws a card. I suppose it doesn't do anything especially good for um, the Ulthrak, but they probably wouldn't mind playing it. And maybe it doesn't do anything too special for uh, the Far Realm, but overall, uh, this guy checks a lot of boxes in the format. It's just very handy. So uh, overall, I'm going to rate this card about a three. Ulthrak Druid. This is a green and a colorless. Uh, two, three. Creature Orc Druid. Uncommon. She has tap, add black, red, or green. That's it. <laughs> very simple, but also very good. A uh, competent attacker and blocker. As a 2 3 for 2. Uh, about the right price for um, the mana production. If you're Ulthrak, um, it's a no brainer. You definitely want this card. She's making all of your colors of mana while giving you like an early game presence. Uh, for the Ulthrak, she's like a 4. But if, for everyone else, I think she's probably like a 3.5. Ulthrak Mana Caller. So this is a green and a colorless for a 2-2 elf druid that's common. She has Vigilance. She taps to make black, red, or green, but you can spend this mana only to cast a creature spell with mana cost 6 or more. So the uncommon we just looked at has an extra point of toughness, and the mana has no restrictions. Um, so even though this card has Vigilance, I would say it's much less valuable uh, than the card we just looked at. Uh, for that reason, you probably don't mind as much to get this one into combat. Um, risk her uh, coming in with Vigilance. Don't, don't mind quite so much if she gets killed. But once you, you know, start coming up to uh, six mana, 
if you're Ulthrak, then you want to keep her alive so you can play all of your giant creatures. Um, this one is not as universally needed <laughs> by the other versions of green. I would say um, if you're Ulthrak, she's probably about a three. You probably should always mix the cut. Not as good as, um, you know, the Ulthrak Shaman or Druid. Uh, for all the other combinations, though, uh, she falls off a lot. You know, maybe you give her a two just because you've got some things that are six or more mana in your deck. If you don't, she's probably just a 1.5. Unsettling Hedrow. This is a green and five colorless. Uh, we have a 5-7 plant horror wall. It is a mythic rare. It has Defender, Reach, and Vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, you gain 5 life and breach. So you get to shuffle, exile the top card. If it's a land, put it into play. If it's a spell, cast it without paying its mana cost. So, very solid board presence. Gains you life. You get value off the breach. And it's got the activated ability. Pay a green and 6 colorless. And it fights up to one target creature. It can attack this turn as though it didn't have Defender. So, in Constructed, this is meant to be part of, uh, like, a Breach deck. Where you just need a, a good critical mass of things that can enter the battlefield and hit a Breach. This one will gain you life in the process. And eventually, you can turn it on to... Uh, start killing the opponent's creatures and attacking. Uh, in Limited, even though this is slow, the fact that it uh, comes down as a great blocker, gains you value off the breach and gains you life, and then you might hit seven mana the following turn to be able to start fighting their things dead and attacking. Uh, in Limited, I think this is a bomb. It's clunky, but it stabilizes the battlefield for you. Possibly even got you like another giant creature with the Breach. And then you get to start machine gunning down their creatures slowly, expensively. Uh, but you get to do it. So... Uh, this has a lot of value and inevitability baked into it. In Limited, I would say this might be a 4.5. You know, it, it might be a little hard to imagine if you're used to fast formats. But this is not a fast format. And you probably will have the time to bring this online and to activate it. Vengeful Tree Folk. Uh, green and three colorless. We have a 4-4 Tree Folk. It's common. It has Trample. And it has Pay 1, Tap, Sacrifice another creature. Put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on Vengeful Tree Folk. So this is meant to be a Nullvir card. White, black, green. This is meant to be a Sacrifice Outlet. Uh, to be like an engine piece for that deck. While also being a win condition. Giant Trampling creature that keeps getting bigger. So uh, the tension on the card is you could either attack with it now or you could leave its activated ability up to grow it. But it doesn't have vigilance, so uh, you have to choose between swinging in or continuing to grow. Uh, the card is good. Uh, the card's especially good if you're Nolvir. If you're Nolvir, I think uh, this is a fantastic card for you. Probably uh, pushing a 3.5. For everyone else, it's a good solid chunk of body. But you might not have a deck that's set up to uh, want to sacrifice creatures. So, uh, for everyone else, it's probably more like a 2.5. A very respectable body that sometimes will get into the deck. Verdigree Deep Root. Uh, green and two colorless. We have a 2-4... Tree Folk Artificer at Uncommon. It has Reach and Trample. 
you can pay three, sacrifice a trash token, put two plus one plus one counters on Verdigree Deep Root, and gain one life. This is for the Zarnik Collective. White, blue, green. They care specifically about trash tokens. So uh, it's a little clunky to activate, but considering it gets two plus one plus one counters each time and you gain a life, uh, this is going to run away in size quickly if you're able to grow it. So, you know, one activation takes it to a four six reach trampler. And then another activation, it's probably the biggest thing on the board at a 6-8 Reach Trampler. And trash tokens are not too hard to produce, so it's just a matter of finding the open mana. Uh, this is a really solid payoff for trash production in Zarnik. Um, for everyone else, it's, uh, yeah, it's a good blocker, but they might or might not have any trash for it, so... Uh, Zarnik, I would say this is probably a 3.5. And for everyone else, um, maybe a 2. You know, maybe you have a stray trash token once in a while. Violent Retort. Uh, green and a colorless. Instant. Common. Choose one. Target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. Or, target creature gets plus 3, plus 2, and trample until end of turn. Uh, this spell is a beating. This spell is just a heck of a beating, and it's because you get to pick between both of these modes, and they're both pretty solid. Either one by itself would be okay. You know, this would be a pretty good combat trick by itself. This would be an okay fight spell by itself, but since you get to pick... Uh, this is incredibly versatile. It can deal with all kinds of situations. Now uh, that green might find itself in. And it's at instant speed. So, opponent tries to play a defensive trick against you, you can blow them out with a violent retort, either by fighting their creature dead, or by pumping your creature in response. Um, this card is just uh, pretty amazing in terms of uh, removal and combat trick combined into one. I think just about any green deck would be very happy to play the first copy of this. Um, I would rate the first copy of it as high as like a 3.5. Um, because it is removal stapled to another great effect. Multiples of this start to taper off in value. But um, even then, you know, there, there are a lot worse things you could put into your deck than this. And Vorgum, Apex Worm. Two green and seven colorless. Legendary creature Worm is mythic rare. It is a 12-12. It has Reach, Trample, Vigilance, and Ward. A Vorgum's controller creates a 6-6 green worm creature token with Trample. So in order to pay the Ward cost, you have to give Vorgum's controller a 6-6 Trampling Worm. Vorgum cannot be countered by spells or abilities. When Vorgum enters the battlefield, search your library for up to six worm cards, reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle. So Vorgum is kind of meant to be like a fun, casual uh, worm commander. But there are enough worms even in this set that in the limited environment... There's like, you know, Oasis Worm, and then there's uh, the 6-5 Worm that we looked at, and then there's the Vanilla Worm, and then I believe there's at least one three-color Worm. Uh, so yeah, there are lots of Worms, and it doesn't say they have to have different names. So if you're not in Commander... You know, you could pick one of those Worms and just take four copies of it. Or however many are in your deck. So uh, Vorgum could play very well in the limited format. And since this is a slower format, as long as you're ramping, in order to get to 9 mana, you really have to push. You have to actually try. 
So some of the four mana cards we looked at that can put out like two mana and stuff like that, you need to play them. <laughs> you really have to push to get to nine mana. But if you do, you could play this massive creature, which is incredibly difficult to get rid of and is going to fill your hand up with other giant things to continue doing in the following turns. And probably you just win the game if you do that. Uh, I think it would be really fun to build around into a ramp deck like that for the format. So even though every deck can't play this, I think anyone who opens this up would be tempted to try. So uh, I'm going to rate it a four. And that is the last card for mono green. So join me next time when we'll be looking at multicolor, uh, getting into some of the real spicy stuff. And then we'll go on to uh, Colorless, where it actually requires the Colorless mana symbol for Thune's faction. And then Artifacts and finally Lands. I hope you're enjoying this journey with me. Um, please like and subscribe and check out my other videos. That helps out the channel a bunch. And until next time, never stop honing your critical thinking and empathy.